So last time we covered a whole bunch of new ideas. And it was really quite a lot of ideas for one class. Here's some of the ideas we covered. We talked about information sets. And these were ways to allow us to model imperfect information. So what's imperfect information? It's a way of being able to capture both simultaneity in moves and, sequen and sequential moves in the same game. So it's a, it's a way that's going to allow us to, to meld the lessons from before the midterm and after the midterm. Then we talked about what strategies meant in this context. And the basic idea is strategies are instruction. A strategy for each player gives them an instruction at each of their information sets. Then we talked about what subgames were. And, the, and leaving aside the technicalities, subgames were just games within games. And finally, we introduced the idea of subgame perfection, which is our new solution concepts that refines the idea of Nash equilibrium. And what subgame perfection is going to do is it's going to instruct the players to play a Nash equilibrium in every subgame. Another way of saying it is a subgame equilibrium is a Nash equilibrium in the, in the whole game, but in each subgame, it induces Nash play as well. All right? Now, we're going to see today examples. If we have time, I'll go through three different examples. And I'll tell you at the end of each example what it is I'm hoping to, uh, to be the takeaway from that example. All right? So last time was a lot of formal stuff. Today is going to be a lot of examples. OK. That's our agenda. Here's a game. Here's our first example. And I call this example, I call this game uh, Don't Screw Up, for reasons we'll see in a minute. All right? So this is a game in which player one has to choose between up and down. If player one chooses up, then player two gets to move and chooses between left and right. And if player two chooses left, then player one gets to move again, and player one chooses between up or down. All right, everyone looking at that game? So why don't we play this game, since we haven't played a game for a while. We'll play a couple of games today. Um, so what I'm going to do is, let's uh, divide the class in two. So if I just draw a line down the middle of the class, OK? Everybody uh, to my left, to your right, everybody over this side of the class is a player one. OK, you're all player ones. All right? And everyone on this side of the class, you're player two, including you guys hiding from the camera. All right? You're player twos. All right? OK, so let's, let's figure out what we're going to do. Right, everyone have time to look at the game? All right, so player ones, you get to move first. Uh, those of you who are going to choose down, raise your hand now. Raise your hand, wave in the air. Raise, keep, keep it up, keep it up so the camera can see you, OK? And those of you who are going to choose up, raise your hands. All right, lots more ups. Those of you who chose up, why don't you all stand up? Why should I, do, you know, I, don't, I don't do all the exercise here. So all those who chose up, stand up. All right, so you can see that choosing down ends the game. So this many people are still playing the game. All right, this many people, everyone who's still sitting down, everyone who's sat down here has exited. All right, player twos, you get to move now. All right, so player twos, those of you who choose right, including the people on this aisle, those people who choose right, raise your hand now. One right over there. Those of you who choose left, raise your hands. All right, why don't you guys all stand up? Just to get you awake in Monday morning, right? Everyone's, everyone's sleepy otherwise. All right, let's go back to player twos. Let's go back to player two. All right, so uh, th those of you who are still alive, sorry, player one, those of you who are still in the game, so those of you who chose up the first time, those of you who chose up the first time, how many of you now choose down? Raise your hand if you choose down. And raise your hand if you choose up. All right, just to get, get a sample of this, let's get the twos to sit down again so I can see if people can see them. So twos, twos sit down. All right, those of you player ones who are, who are still in the game, who are choosing up, raise your hand now. All right, I think it's everybody. It's everybody. Is that correct? OK, you can all sit down. OK? OK. So let's just talk about this game for a while, and then we'll analyze it. Now, this is not a difficult game from the point of view of stuff we've done since the midterm. It's pretty clear what we should do in this game by backward induction. So why don't we start there? OK, so by backward induction, we find that if player one if player one gets to move a second time, then they're choosing between four and three, and they're going to choose four. All right? And player two, pl 
player two, if they get to move, knowing that player one is going to choose up tomorrow, they're going to be choosing between three if they choose left or two if they choose right. So they're going to stay in the game and choose left, which is what most of you did. All right? And finally, player one at the beginning of the game knows that player two is going to choose left, whereupon she's going to choose up. So if she chooses up, she's going to end up getting four. And if she chooses down, she's going to get two, so she's going to choose up. So it's clear what backward induction does in this game, and that's what most people did in the game. Is that right? Is that right? However, not everybody did it. Some of the player ones, some of the player ones, actually, when you raise your hand, those are people who chose, who chose down. The ones who chose down. There are more than that, because you didn't all stand up. Those who didn't stand up just now, raise your hand. People are hiding now, but it's okay. Those people who chose down, they may have had a reason for choosing down, and their reason for choosing down might have been that they thought that even though they, you know, they can do backward induction, so even though they know that by backward induction, up gets them the better answer, they might be worried that if they choose up, player two will screw up and choose right. And notice that if player two chooses right, then player one only gets one, whereas down yielded two. So in some sense, down was the, quote, safe thing to do for player one, given that they might be worried that player two might screw up. Right? Does that roughly just nod if this is the case? For those people who chose down, is that kind of what you were thinking? Some people are shaking their heads, but some people are nodding. That's a good sign. All right? All right? Now, why might player two, in fact, screw up and choose right? Because player two might themselves think that player one might screw up at this stage. If player, if player one were to screw up at the last stage and choose down, then player two, by choosing left, would only get one. And for him, the safe option, therefore, is right, which yields two. All right? So to get the backward induction answer here, which most of, we did, most of us did, to get the backward induction answer here relies play on player one trusting player two to play backward induction. And that requires player one to have trust in player two, trusting player one not to screw up at the last stage. So say it again. Player one needs player two not to screw up. And that means player one needs to trust that player two will trust her not to screw up. All right, everyone see the game? OK, OK. So let's try and analyze this game using what we learned last time and see what we find. So the first thing to do is let's, let's look at strategies in this game. So player two has just, one, has just has two strategies, left and right, because he, uh, player two only has one information set. And notice, this game is actually a game of perfect information. Right? This game is a game of perfect information, so it's going to be very easy. Player one has two information sets, this information set and that information set. At each of them, player one has two choices, so she must have four strategies in all. All right? So this, this game, when we put it in its matrix form, is going to be a four by two game. Here it is. And the strategies for player one are up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. And the strategies for player two are just left and right. And now we can put the payoffs in. So up, up, left gets us four, three. Up, up, right gets us. Uh, um, up, up, right gets us one, two. Uh, up, down, left uh, gets us three, one. Uh, up, up, right gets us one, two again. We end up exiting the game here. Down, up uh, is easy because it's just exiting the game at the first stage. So all of these are going to be just two, one. Okay, we're happy with that. All right, so what I've done is translate the game into its matrix form. And let's look for Nash equilibria in this game. All right, just look for Nash equilibria. Let me, let me do it at the board since it's quite easy at this stage. So to look for Nash equilibria, let's, let's, let's just worry about pure strategy equilibria for now. All right, so if player two was choosing left, then player one's best response is the up-up strategy. And if player two is choosing right, then player one's best response is either down-up or down, down. That's exactly the conversation we just had. If player two was going to, quote, screw up and choose right, then player one wants to get out of the game immediately. All right? Conversely, if player one is choosing up, up, then player two is happy and is going to choose left. He's going to trust, uh, is trusting player one. If player one was going to choose up, down, however, 
then player two, you know, if, if that, that's player one screwing up at the second stage, so in that case, player two wants to get out of the game and choose right. If player one is choosing down up, then player two uh, is actually, that doesn't matter, they're indifferent, and if player two is choosing down down, then once again, player two is indifferent, since they don't get to move at all. All right? So from this, we see that there are three Nash equilibria. Let me call them one, two, and three. All right, so one Nash equilibrium is up, up, left. Another Nash equilibrium is down, up, right. That's here. And a third equilibrium is down, down, right. Down, down, right. All right, so there are three pure strategy Nash equilibria in this game. And let's just see what they do. So the first one, up, up, left, is up, left, up. So it gets us to here. All right? So this one is the same equilibrium as corresponds to backward induction. Is that right? This one's the backward induction equilibrium. And the other two are different. Down, up, right, and down, down, right, both end up down here, e exiting the game immediately. Right? So both of these other equilibria fail backward induction. So let's put backward induction with a line through it. Right? They're, they're failing backward induction. All right? And so you may ask, why are they equilibria? Well, we've seen examples like this before, for example, in the entry game. We also saw examples last time. So in this, in this, in this game, the reason these are equilibria, even though they fail backward induction, is exactly coincides with that conversation we just had about worrying about the other person screwing up. All right, so in particular, in particular, if player one thinks that player two is choosing right, that is to say, thinks that player two is gonna screw up, then player one doesn't want to travel up the tree because she knows she'll be carried down here, and instead, she just chooses the safe option and gets two. Right, so from player one's point of view, if player two was going to choose right, then getting out, of, getting out of the game, doing the safe thing, is the best response for player one. And from player two's point of view, if player one's exiting the game, it really doesn't matter what player two says she's going to do, right? because she doesn't get to move anyway. All right, so that's why these are both equilibrium. Okay, so what we want to do next, what we want to do next, we've translated this into a tree, we've written down the strategies, we want to actually see which of these Nash equilibria are subgame perfect? Which of these Nash equilibria are subgame perfect? All right, let me give myself a bit more room here because I want to keep this in sight. So let's get rid of this and raise this one. All right. So the next question is which of these three Nash equilibria are subgame perfect? All right, to do that, we need to start by identifying the subgames. And of course, having just hoisted that board up there, I have to hoist it down again. Okay, so what are the subgames here? Well, the simplest subgame, the simplest subgame is this simple subgame at the end in which player one moves. All right, that's a very obvious subgame, is that right? That's a little game with a game. It's a rather trivial game because it's a one player game, but it is a game. So let's examine that one first. That's the last subgame. All right, so the last subgame here is a somewhat trivial subgame. It looks like this. Player one is the only mover, and they're choosing either up or down. And the payoffs are 4-3 and 3-1. And frankly, we don't really care at this point what player two's payoffs are, because player one is the only person who's playing in this subgame. All right, but nevertheless, let's put them there. And if we write this up as a matrix, Here it is as a matrix. It's player one is the only mover. They're choosing between up and down, and the payoffs are four, three, and three, one. And of course, player two doesn't get to move, so player two, doesn't, uh, player two uh, is irrelevant here. And clearly, clearly the only Nash equilibrium in this game, clearly the only Nash equilibrium in this game is for player one to choose up. Right? Player two, it doesn't really matter what, what they choose. There's nothing, nothing, nothing they can do about it anyway. But for player, uh, for player one to choose up 
is the Nash equilibrium. So the Nash equilibrium in this trivial subgame is one just chooses up. Is that right? So let's look at the play induced by our three candidate Nash equilibria in this subgame. All right? So each of our candidate Nash equilibria, here they are, this one, this one, and this one, in, have an instruction of how player one should play in this subgame. And let me just pause a second. The reason that these three equilibria have an instruction for how player one should play in the subgame is because of our definition of a strategy. Each strategy tells the player how they should move at every information set of the uh, uh, every, every information set of that player. So even if the strategy is such that, that is, is such that that e information set won't be reached, the strategy still has to tell you what you would do when you got there. And now, for the first time, perhaps we're going to see why that redundancy helps us. All right. So let's look at the instructions. Each of them gives an instruction. The first one, the first one tells us to play up in the subgame. The first one says up. The second one, the second one says up again. And notice this was redundant, right? If you, once you've chosen down, you know you're not going to get to make a choice at the third at the at the third node or your second node, but nevertheless, there's the instruction and it says up. Right? And the third one and the third one says down. All right, it says down. So this is the instructions of these three equilibria in this little subgame. Right? This, this is the play prescribed by these three equilibria in this subgame. All right, two of them say up, and th those ones are going to induce the Nash equilibrium in the subgame. But the third one does not. The third one says down, and that's not allowed. That's not allowed in a subgame perfect equilibrium because in a subgame equilibrium, a subgame perfect equilibrium has to uh, prescribe play in every subgame that's Nash. And here, the third equilibrium is telling player one to choose down, which is not a Nash equilibrium in the subgame. All right? So three, so what are we doing here? Let's make, make, make it clear. We're finding the subgame perfect equilibria. And what we've done is, number three is eliminated because it induces play in this subgame that is not. Nash equilibrium. Not a Nash equilibrium in the subgame. All right, we're really putting stuff together now. This really used, to be, to be able to draw this conclusion, we really used the fact that uh, strategy three contained a redundant instruction, an instruction down uh, at this node that was never reached. But that helped us get rid of it. All right, so that one's gone. That one's gone. Three is gone. All right, let's proceed. Uh, I'm going to run out of board space here. Have people got this one down? People got this down? All right, I'll bring it back in a second. Uh, almost. Let me give it a second. Let me give it a second. All right. What I want to do now is look at the next subgame. All right. Maybe what I can do, if I just remove this comment, I can work on the right-hand board. That'll, that'll allow you just to look at it. So all that comment said was three is eliminated. And let me work now on the right-hand half of this board. That'll allow it to be up there a bit longer. Okay. So let's now look at the next subgame. And again, we're going to work from the back. So the next subgame, the next subgame back is the subgame that starts from this node. All right, the subgame that starts from that node. All right, so that, let's identify that in a different color. Uh, I use blue, so let me use pink. So now we're going to look at this subgame. This big pink subgame. All right, and again, in this pink subgame, this game looks like looks like this. It starts with player two choosing between left and right, and then player one has to choose up or down, and the payoffs are one, two, four, three, 
and 3, 1. All right, once again, let's look at the matrix form of this subgame. And this is a little bit less trivial than the last one because now there are really two players playing. So here's the matrix that goes along with this. Player uh, one is choosing between up or down, and player two is choosing between left or right. And this is slightly, slightly cheating because, in fact, uh, player one is, is, is uh, player one, of course, knows what player two is going to have done by the time she moves. But never mind; it'll do for now. All right. And let's put the payoffs in. So up left is four three, and uh, uh, down left is three one. And uh, up right is 1, 2. And this must also be 1, 2. All right, happy, everyone happy with that? So just putting the, putting the payoffs in. And let's just look again at pure strategy Nash equilibrium here. OK, there are actually mixed ones. But let's just worry about pure ones for now. All right, so the pure Nash equilibrium here in this little sub game are what? Well, let's just see. If 2 chose left, then 1 wants to choose up. Uh, 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 if two choose, chooses left, then one wants to choose up. If two chooses right, it doesn't really matter what one chooses because she isn't going to get to move anyway. All right. Uh, conversely, if one chooses up, then two wants to choose left. That's the example of one not screwing up, so two wants to stay in the game. But if one was to choose down, then player two would like to get out of the game. So if, 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 if player two thinks one is going to screw up, she wants to exit the game. All right, and very quickly we can see there are two equilibria here. One of them is up left, and the other one is down right. All right, they correspond to uh, ending, playing down, down this way, that's down right, and up left, playing up. Right? And once again, let's look at our three equilibria in the parent game. Here's our three equilibria in the parent game. Three. And let's see what play they induce in this little subgame. So we'll do exactly what we did before. So one, two, and three. These are our three equilibria from above. And equilibrium number one, up, up, left, in this game prescribes up, Left. Is that right? And equilibrium number two, down, up, right, down, up, right, here prescribes up, right. And equilibrium number three, down, down, right, here prescribes down, right. So which of these are prescribing Nash equilibria in the subgame? Well, up left is an equilibrium. It's that one. Up left is an equilibrium, so this is OK. And down right was an equilibrium. So three is OK in this subgame. All right? But up right, up right is not. Up right is not a Nash equilibrium. All right? So in this, in this subgame, uh, Nash equilibrium number two the down, up, right equilibrium is prescribing play that is not a Nash equilibrium in the subgame, so it's eliminated. It can't be a subgame perfect equilibrium. So here, two is eliminated since it induces non Nash equilibrium play. In this subgame. All right. And now we're done. We, we know about the whole game. So what we did here, we started with the whole game. We found all. Th we found there were three Nash equilibria. We found that only one of them agreed with backward induction. We then looked at the subgames. We first of all looked at that blue subgame, and we found that one of the equilibria, equilibrium number three, was eliminated. The equilibrium number three is not prescribing Nash behavior in this subgame. Right? Then we looked at the slightly more complicated subgame, the pink subgame, and we found that equilibrium number two prescribes the behavior up right, which is not Nash in this subgame. Right? At this stage, we've eliminated two of the three equilibria, and we're just left with one. And the one we're left with, the one we're left with, 
the only subgame perfect equilibrium, the only equilibrium that wasn't eliminated by the fact it would prescribe bad behavior in subgames, the only SPE is number one, which is up, up, and left. And what do we notice? We notice that that's the equilibrium, that's the play that backward induction would have selected. All right, so notice, notice this is the backward induction prediction. All right, so what are the lessons here? The lessons here are that our new idea, our idea of subgame perfect equilibrium, is pretty easy to, to go about finding. You just look at subgames and check that the play in each subgame has to be Nash play. All right, in fact, if you start at the back, uh, you'll construct it by rolling backwards, much like we did backward induction. Right? Start at the last subgame and work backwards. And the second thing is, not surprisingly, given, given that remark, not surprisingly, where backward induction applies, for example, in this game, the subgame perfect equilibrium will find the equilibrium that is consistent with backward induction. And remember, that's what, that was our aim last week. We wanted a way of refining Nash equilibrium to throw away those Nash equilibria that were inconsistent with backward induction. So subgame perfect equilibrium has done that. It tells us now, if backward induction applies, the Nash equilibria you should focus on are the subgame perfect equilibria. And indeed, most people in the class played that equilibrium just now. All right? Okay. So that's really all I want to say about this example. But let me just make a remark in passing. I made this mark in the middle, so let me just make it again. When we write down strategies, those strategies tell us what seem to be redundant moves. But, the, but being forced to write down those redundant moves is useful because it allows us to model what other people think you would have done at those later nodes. And sometimes I have to think what you think I would have done at this later node before I decide not to go down that branch of the tree. So being able to write down everything in a strategy allows us to have, to have everything in front of us and makes that analysis simple, and that's exactly what we do here. All right, so this was a fairly mundane example because in particular, we didn't use any kind of information set. So next, let's look at an example that does use some information sets. All right, so new example. Let me clean this off. And once again, I want to play this example, but what I'd really like to do, I'm going to call this game the matchmaker game. The matchmaker game. And I, what, I, what I'd actually like to find out is, uh, do we still have our couple we tried to send on a date, our hapless couple we tried to send on a date uh, in about week three? Are you guys still here? Ah, oh, there's the guy. What, what's your name again? David. David. And what was the... Uh, is she hiding? Oh, there she is. Thank you, thank you. And, and your name was? Nina. Nina. Nina and David. Good, good. Can we get some mics to Nina and David, actually? Uh, let, let, me, let me do it. And I'll go on talking while I'm doing this. So let me... That's okay. Um, uh, where's David? Oh, thank you. And uh, uh, let me grab him. Ali, can you get Mike to Nina? That would be great. Thank you. All right. So for weeks, we've been trying to get this couple to go on a date. It's our, <laughs> it's our attempt to get economics majors to become real people. <laughs> it's a hard thing to do. And uh, they're kind of the hapless couple because we, we, you know, we, first we sent them to the movies, and they end up going to different movies. And then we sent them off for a romantic weekend in New England, and they end up doing different things. And one went to the theater, another went apple picking. I forget which way around it was. And at this point, I figure I'm a pretty bad matchmaker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a third player into the game as the matchmaker. So first of all, I'll, I'll write down what the game is. All right? So the game at this point, the game's going to look like this. Player one is the matchmaker. We can call him player M, if you like. And he has a choice. He or she has a choice. Uh, he, uh, she could not send the couple out on the date. Or she could send the couple out on the date. 
right? But being a better matchmaker than me, if she sends them out on the date, she's going to stake some money. You know, she'll pay for the date. She'll pay for the date. All right? And in the date, once again, uh, they're trying to meet. And once again, unfortunately, they haven't figured out where to meet. All right? Well, we'll put the payoffs in in a second. We'll tell you what the strategies are. Uh, all right, so what, so what I'm going to assume here is I'm going to let uh, Jake, our TA, uh, be our matchmaker. And the reason I'm choosing Jake is I think he's the nearest thing I, can, I have in mind in this class to being a Jewish mother. I mean, he's neither Jewish. He's, I, think, I think he's not Jewish and he's not my mother, but he, you know, he, he, he is the TA who's responsible for bringing me some drink every day in case I pass out in the lecture. So that, that's the nearest thing I can think of. So Jake's going to be our Jewish mother, and Jake's going to either uh, send these guys on a date or not. And Jake's smarter than me at this. He's actually good at matchmaking. And what he's going to do is he's going to send them somewhere where they really, well, he knows Yale students better than I do, and he's going to send them really somewhere where they're going to meet. So he's going to send them to go to the same lecture class next year, and then they'll be sitting in the aisles in this huge lecture class, and they're bound to meet. All of you have sat next to other people at some point. So you know, that, that seems like a good idea. So the classes he thinks of sending them to, he says, go to a large lecture class. So they're either going to go to uh, the Gaddis class, or, which is called Cold War, or to the Spence class, which is called China. Everyone know about these classes, right? Right? And these seem like these seem like reasonable classes uh, to go to, to, to to meet to meet your you know to meet to have a date to meet somebody. I mean, the Cold War kind of like fun class. I mean, you hope it isn't a prediction of the future relationship, but it, it, Cold War <laughs> seems alright. And uh, China's, a, by all accounts, is a fantastic class. It involves you know something involving 20 million people, most of whom are in the class, I gather. So uh, it's a pretty big class. So let's let's do that. So we'll call this gap. Unfortunately. Jake makes the same mistake I do. He's not going to tell them which class to go to. So they have to decide whether to take uh, Gaddis or Spence. And once again, uh, they're coordinating. We'll call them players two and three. So here they are trying to coordinate. And the payoffs are as follows. So let's put in Jake's payoffs first of all. So if they manage to coordinate, oh, first of all, if, if Jake doesn't send them, everybody gets nothing. All right? And if Jake does send them and they coordinate, Jake makes one because he feels really happy about this. Uh, after all, I mean, there must be some motivation for people matchmaking. Uh, and uh, if, so if they coordinate down here, Jake gets one as well. But if they fail to coordinate, uh, Jake feels rotten about it, particularly because you know, he paid for them to go to this class, whatever the cost of a class at Yale is, which is probably quite a lot, actually. I don't know. All right. All right. So, OK, we'll call it one, though. All right. And otherwise, the payoffs are exactly the same as the payoffs we used when we looked at this game earlier on in the course. So the payoffs are going to be 2-1 uh, here, and 0-0 zero, zero if they fail to coordinate, and 0-0 zero, zero here if they fail to coordinate, and 1-2 one, two, one, two here. All right, so, th so the implication of this is that player 2, who we'll assume is, is uh, David, is that right? Da David. So David would like to meet uh, Nina, but uh, all other things being equal, he'd like to meet her at the Cold War. And Nina would like to meet David, but all other things being equal, she would like to meet uh, in China. I mean, not literally in China, but in, in the class China. <laughs> all right? All right, so this is our game. All right, and we're going to analyze this game. But before we analyze it, let's try and play it. So, so um, uh, what we need to do is, uh, first of all, uh, let's make sure things work smoothly. Let's have David write down uh, which class he's going to choose, and Nina write down which class she's going to choose. I've lost sight of Nina. Someone needs to point out. There she is. Right, write down what class you're going to choose. OK. Something been written down? OK. And uh, Jake, uh, you've got your mic there. Sorry, Jake, are you going to send this hapless couple or not? So, so I have Dave in my section, actually, and I hear how much he's been talking about Nina. So there I'm going to roll the dice and send them. I'm All gonna right, going to send them. OK, good, good. All right, so we have them going off to this class. All right, and uh, now let's see what they wrote down. So uh, Dave, what did you write down? I'm going to give it and go to China. You're going to go to China. And Nina? I chose S. You, you do? Oh, great, so they managed to meet. So that was a successful date. So let's give them a round of applause. All right. I, I hear it's a great class, too. And in fact, I don't think it's going to happen forever, because I think he must be approaching retirement. So that seems a pretty good choice. So, so good. OK, that worked very well. Let's have a look now at this. Let's analyze this game and see what we can do with this game. All right? So how are we going to analyze this game? So no surprise, we're going to use the idea of a subgame perfect equilibrium. All right, I'll, I'll collect the mics later, don't worry. All right? So uh, we're going to use the idea of a subgame perfect equilibrium. 
So how do we, how do we figure out uh, how to work out what the subgame perfect equilibrium is? We're going to use the same basic idea that we use it when we, uh, what we've been using all along in backward induction. And it's the same idea in the game we just looked at just now. What we're going to do is, rather than start from the last decision node, you can't do that anymore and work backwards. Instead of doing that, we're going to start from the last subgame and work backwards. And in this example, it's pretty obvious what the last subgame is, right? The last subgame, the game within a game, there is only really one, the game within the game is this object here. Is that right? This is the game within the game. Now, I could, at this stage, I could do something else. I could write down the whole matrix for the whole game and have uh, Jake choose uh, the matrix and, and uh, Dave and Nina choose the, uh, the row and the column, but that's going to you know, get us astray. So let's not, that, we, we could do that, but let's not worry about that. Let's just, let's just start doing things backwards. So when we do things backwards, we'll start at the last subgame, and that last subgame is a, an old friend of ours. It looks exactly like this. Let's just write it in. All right, so here's, it involves players two and three. All right, and two is choosing between Gaddis and Spence, and three was choosing between Gaddis and Spence, and uh, their payoffs were, let me leave a space here, so it was two, one, one, two, zero, 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 zero. So here are the payoffs of the relevant players in the game, but while we're here, why don't we put in Jake's payoffs as well? So Jake's payoffs were one here, one here, minus one here, and minus one there. All right, so the only relevant players here are players two and three, but I've put player one's payoffs in as well, because why not? Why not just keep track of them? Okay, everyone happy that that's, that's exactly describes this little game? All right, for all intents and purposes, we can forget the first payoff, but there it is. All right, and this is a game we've seen many times so far. It's the battle of the sexes, or the battle of Dave and Nina, and uh, in this game, we already know what the uh, equilibria are, so uh, the uh, equilibria here, let me just underline uh, best responses, uh, so if, uh, if Nina is choosing Gaddis, then Dave chooses Gaddis. If Nina is choosing Spence, then Dave would like to choose Spence and uh, conversely. All right, so I just underlined the best responses for the players who are actually involved in the game. I haven't bothered underlining anything for Jake because he isn't a player in this game. Does that make sense? All right, so the pure Nash equilibria in this game, the pure Nash equilibria in this game are essentially Gaddis, Gaddis or Spence, Spence. All right? All right? That's pretty easy. All right? And from Jake's point of view, each of these pure strategy Nash equilibria yield a payoff of hit for him of what? How, what does he get? If they, if they go to Gaddis, Gaddis, he's happy that they met and he gets one. And if they choose Spence, Spence, he's happy that they met and he gets one. Jake doesn't really matter. Jake himself doesn't really mind whether Dave and Nina uh, learn about China or learn about the Cold War. He just wants them to meet. All right? So uh, both of these uh, yield one for Jake. Both yield a value, let's call it, a value of one for player one, for player one, who's Jake. All right? So from Jake's point of view, from Jake's point of view, going back a stage, what we're going to do now, just a bit, just a bit with backward induction, we're going to roll the game back. So we started by analyzing this subgame, and now we're going to roll back a stage, just as we did with backward induction. So when we roll back, Jake is moving here. If Jake chooses not to send them, not to send them, then we get zero, 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 but the key, the key part of this is the first zero. That's Jake's payoff. And if Jake sends them, if Jake sends them, then what Jake gets is the value to Jake. Oh, well, okay, I'll put it to Jake, but value to player one. Okay, value to Jake of the Nash equilibria in this subgame. Right, rather well, a big thing to write, but that's what, that's what Jake gets. And the others do too, the others get that as well. And in this case, in this case, rather than writing that long piece, this is just equal to one. Is that right? right? So if Jake sends them, he knows that they're gonna play a Nash equilibrium in this subgame, or he believes they're gonna play a Nash equilibrium in this subgame, and either of those two Nash equilibria in the subgame, hang, hang on a second, either of the two Nash equilibria in the subgame yield a payoff to Jake of one. 
All right. So actually, uh, the, 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 the one of them is one. One of them yields payoffs of one one two, and the other yields payoffs of one two one. But since Jake is the only mover here, let's just focus on Jake. All right. So from Jake's point of view, he's really choosing between zero and one. So he's going to choose send. All right. So the Nash. The, sorry, so the subgame perfect equilibrium. The subgame perfect equilibrium. Therefore, there are actually two of them here. One is send Spence. Spence, that's what actually happened. But there's another one, which is send Gaddis, Gaddis. Right, that would also have been a pure strategy, uh, subgame perfect equilibrium. Right, so in either case, what we did is to just to remind ourselves we first of all solved the equilibrium down the subgame, the equilibrium in this blue subgame. We figured out how much that equilibrium was worth for everybody, but in particular for Jake, but for everybody. And then we rolled that payoff back and looked at Jake's choice. Right? In this particular case, that gave us two equilibria, send Spence Spence and send Gaddis Gaddis. However, some of you must be suspecting at this point that there's actually another subgame perfect equilibrium here. Right? How do we know that? What does the thing about this game? I mean, we've been trying to send this couple on a date uh, all semester. They haven't gone on a date all semester. I'm embarrassing them now, but they haven't gone on a date all semester. So there must be some possibility that they would fail to coordinate. And it would be a pretty weird notion of equilibrium that concluded that they always manage to coordinate, and hence Jake always wants to send them. Is that right? So let's also look at the other equilibria here. Now the reason there's another equilibrium in this subgame, the reason there's a, the reason there's another equilibrium, sorry, the reason there's another equilibrium in the whole game, the reason there's another subgame perfect equilibrium in the whole game is that there's another Nash equilibrium in the subgame. What's the other Nash equilibrium in the subgame? They could mix, right? They could mix, right? They could, right. So it turns out that in the subgame. In the subgame, here it is. There's also a third mixed equilibrium. There is a mixed Nash equilibrium. All right. Now we could we know how to work that out. We could we could write down a p and a q, and we could look for those indifference conditions and solve it out. But this is a subgame. Sorry, this, this is a game. This this subgame corresponds to a game we've seen many times in this class so far. And I think we probably remember what that equilibrium is. Is that right? I do anyway. So let's see if you remember it as well. I'll write it down, and we'll see if you all look alarmed. So I claim the equilibrium. The other equilibrium has Dave playing with probability two thirds, one third and has Nina playing with probability one-third, two-thirds. Right, so this is another equilibrium in the subgame. People remember that this was an equilibrium in Battle of the Sexes, yeah? Yeah, people nodding at me, yeah, okay. So, so it isn't too unintuitive. We, we, could, we all know how we'd work it out. We could go back and put in the P and the Q, but it isn't too unintuitive. It has uh, Dave going more often to the lecture course that he would prefer all other things being equal, and it has Nina going more often to the lecture course that she would prefer all other things be equal. And they do so in just such a way as to make each of them indifferent. All right. Now, this subgame induces a different value for Jake. Right? So suppose Jake thinks, I trust Dave and Nina to play a Nash equilibrium in their subgame, but I don't know which one it is, and I think maybe they're going to play this one. Right? So suppose, suppose Jake thinks that this is the equilibrium that Dave and Nina are going to play. So now, should Jake send them or not? Well, let's work it out. Let's work it out. So now, now, if he sends them, if Jake sends Dave and Nina, or more anonymously, if player one sends players two and three, all right, then with what probability will they meet? In what probability will they meet? Well, this is just a little math exercise. Let's have a look at the game again. So Dave is playing 
two thirds, one third, is that right? And Nina is playing two thirds, one third. All right, is that right? So the probability of their meeting is the probability of this box, they could meet at Gaddis, plus the probability of this box, they could meet at Spence. Is that right? So the probability of this box is one third times two thirds. So this box has probability two ninths. And the probability of this box is two thirds times one third. So this, probability ha this box has probability two ninths. So the probability of their meeting is two ninths plus two ninths that makes four ninths. All right, everyone okay with that? All right, so if Jake sends Dave and Nina and they play this mixed strategy equi equilibrium, then they meet with probability two ninths plus two ninths, two ninths at, at Gaddis, two ninths at Spence for a total of four ninths. All right, which means they fail to meet and hence fail to meet with probability, well, if they're meeting with probability four ninths, what must be the probability that they're failing to meet? Five ninths, thank you. So they fail to meet with probability five ninths, all right? So Jake's expected payoff, if he sends them, the value for Jake of this equilibrium is what? So the value, the value to Jake of this Nash equilibrium, if he sends them, is 4 ninths times 1 plus 5 ninths times minus 1 for a total of minus a ninth. Everyone okay with that? Right, so if Jake sends them, they fail to meet 5 ninths of the time, and he gets minus 1 each of those times, they succeed in meeting four ninths of the time, he gets plus one each of those times. So his expected payoff, his expected value from sending Dave and Nina on the date is minus a ninth. All right? So from Jake's point of view, what this game looks like, if he thinks this is the if he thinks that this is the Nash equilibrium being played, if he doesn't send, he gets zero. And if he does, he gets the value of this Nash equilibrium, which in this case is minus one ninth, so he's not going to send. All right, and the SPE here is not send, mix, mix. All right, where this, where this is the mix. All right, so there's a third equilibrium here in which our matchmaker says this hapless couple is just too hapless, they're going to play the mixed strategy equilibrium, in which case it isn't worth my while sending them on the date. You, you guys were lucky because Jake chose the other equilibrium. He figured you were playing the other equilibrium, which it turned out that you were. All right? So in this game, there were three subgame perfect equilibria. One for each of the Nash equilibria and the subgame, as it turned out. There was one in which Jake sent them, and they coordinated on the pure strategy equilibrium in the game SS. There was one in which Jake sent them, and they coordinated on the pure strategy equilibrium in the subgame GG. And there's one in which Jake didn't send them, but had he in fact sent them, they would have both mixed, and hence, for a lot of the time, failed to coordinate. All right? And what's the big lesson here? Right, the big lesson of the first game we saw this morning was that subgame perfect equilibrium implies backward induction. Right? The big lesson of this game, other than the fact that we're getting closer to getting Dave and Nina on their date, the big lesson of this game is to show that to find subgame perfect equilibria, all you have to do is keep your head and solve out the Nash equilibria in each of the subgames, roll the payoffs back up, and then look for behavior up the tree. Right, once again, you look for the Nash equilibria in each of these subgames, roll the payoffs back up, and then see how behavior, see what the optimal moves are higher up the tree. All right. So we have time to do one more example. All right. And the third example I want to do is more of an application. All right.
right? So, so far we've seen some fairly simple examples. Now I want to do an application. And the application I want to do is kind of a classic business school case, if you like, or mini case, uh, involving strategic investment. All right, and the game is this, or well, the setting is this. There are two firms, we'll call them A and B, and these two firms, initially, before we start considering the, the before, before we start initially, uh, considering what we're actually going to talk about, initially, they are playing corno competition. So two firms, and they're playing corno competition. And we can imagine that they're producing fertilizer. Right? Imagine that they're producing fertilizer. All right? And let's be specific here. Let's assume that the prices in this market are given by the following demand curve, two minus one-third times QA plus QB. Right? So this is the demand curve that they face. All right? And we'll assume that costs, marginal costs, C is equal to a dollar a ton. All right? All right? So this is, this, is the, this is the price in dollars per ton, price per ton in dollars. And the costs are a dollar per ton. Right? Um, in a minute, what we're going to do is we're going to consider a change in this game. But before we do that, let's just remind ourselves what the corner equilibrium of this game would look like. All right? Let's do a bit of a review. All right? so it's a while since we've seen corners. Let's remind ourselves. So I claim, I claim that the quantity, the corner quantity chosen, Q star, has the formula A minus C over 3B. Is that right? right? If you go back in your notes, you'll find it. So we, 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 I'm not going to resolve it here. We've done it many times. So A minus C minus 3B, trust me, is what came out of our calculation before the midterm. And what I want to do is, I just want to make sure we can translate that into numbers here. It's all we're all having in letters, but let's translate it into numbers. So in particular, this A, this A is this 2. Is that right? This C is this 1, and this B is this third. Is that right? So let's just put that down. So what this, in, this, in this case, this is 2 minus 1 over 3 times a third. Right? 2 minus 1 times 3 minus a third. So this says that the quantity is one, and this is, this is million tons, so the quantity here, the corner quantity, is a million tons each. Right? So one each. So each, in this equilibrium, each of these two firms is producing a million tons of fertilizer. All right? And what else do we know? We know, therefore, what prices must be. Let's just do that before we even get started. So prices must be two minus a third times the quantity that the first firm produces plus the quantity that the second firm produces. So that's 2 minus 2 thirds. So that should be 4 thirds, if I've got that right, or 1 and a third. So prices here are $1.33 uh, per ton. All right? And finally, profits. So profit for each firm here in this equilibrium, before we even start the game, pro uh, before we start the more interesting part of the game, profit is what? So they're going to get one dollar and one third for every ton they produce. It's going to cost them one dollar to produce each ton, and they're producing one million of these things. All right. So their profits are should be a dollar sign here as well. Their profits are one-third, if, if these are millions, they're producing one-third, uh, th th sorry, their, their profits are one-third of a million dollars. All right? All right? So this is their per period profit, right? In each period they're doing this. Each year they're doing this, and this is their profits in each period. 
Right? So this is a simple model we've done many times before. This is Cournot. And now we're going to make it more interesting. Right, everything, if the algebra here was a bit quick, don't worry about it. Check it at home. It's, very, it's just basic, basic algebra. All right? So now suppose that you are the manager of firm A. All right, this is classic, I don't say this, classic business school case. I'm looking up at my business school students in the, in the balcony. Right, you're the manager of firm A, and you have to choose whether to uh, accept uh, uh, an offer to rent a new machine. All right, so this new machine has two features. All right, the first, well, three features. The first feature is it only works for A. All right, so this machine is being offered to you. It wouldn't fit in to firm B's technology. So this is only being offered for A. The second feature of this machine is it costs $0.7 million in rental. So each year you rent this machine, you'd have to pay $0.7 million. All right? But th that's, that's the bad news. The good news is it will lower A's costs to 50 cents a ton. All right, so classic business school situation. You're the manager of a firm. You're involved in competition with another firm, B. And suddenly, an opportunity comes along to rent some new technology. It's going to cost you 0.7 a year to rent this machine. But it will lower your costs by 50 cents a ton. All right, so this, this is a classic thing that you might be asked in your interview for Morgan Stanley next week. How many of you are interviewing with investment banks? This week? No one's going to admit it. In a couple of years when you're, when you're interviewing with, uh, with these guys. All right? So what's the obvious question? The obvious question is, should you go ahead and rent this new technology or not? Should you rent it or not? To rent or not to rent? To rent or not to rent? All right, less dramatic than its equivalent question in the English class, but important nevertheless. All right. This board is stuck, unfortunately, so I'll have to raise that a bit more. There we go. All right. So what I want to do is I want to analyze this three times. And each time I analyze it, I want us to see what I'm doing, what mistakes I'm making, because I want you guys, when you interview with Morgan Stanley about this kind of thing, to impress them so that they tell lots of people to come to Yale and preferably give lots of money to Yale. All right, so we're going to look at this way three different times. And the first thing we're going to do, the first way we're going to look at this is look at it as if we were accountants. We're going to look at the accountant's answer to this question. And some of you may decide you don't want to interview with Morgan Stanley or McKinsey. You might want to uh, interview with some, uh, some accounting firm when you leave Yale. God forbid, but you might. All right, so uh, let's have a look at how the accountants would answer this question. All right, so I, I think the accountants would do this. They would say, well, before we do this, let's have a poll. How many people think you should rent? You've got time to think about it now. So how many people think you should rent the new machine? And how many people think you should not rent the new machine? Oh, no, I'm not going to allow abstentions here. Let's try it again. All right, without no abstentions, right? You can't, abstain, you can't abstain in an interview. All right, so you're on the spot. You're in the boardroom. All right, how many think you should rent the new machine? Raise your hands, wave them in the air. How many people think you should not rent the new machine? All right, so we're split kind of down the middle. I'm looking at my MBA students, see which they voted. Which did you guys vote, R rent or not vote? Rent, okay, so the MBA students think rent, so we'll see if that's right. All right, so let's, let's, let's move forward. All right, so accounting, accountant's answer. So I think what the accountant's gonna say is this. They're gonna say, Produ right now you're producing a million tons a year. All right, the new machine saves you a year. Let's, let's put per annum. Let's try, let's try and be fancy here. So a million tons per annum. The new machine saves you 50 cents per ton. So if you rent this new machine, you're producing a million tons a year. It's going to save you 50 cents a ton. So it's going to save you... 
one million a year in variable cost. Right? And those people who own 115 or 150 know what I mean by variable cost. These are costs you're going to save in, in the actual production of your fertilizer. So it saves you half a million a year. Right? Unfortunately, it costs you cost of machine, which is a fixed cost, as a fixed cost of 0.7 million a year. Right? And 0.7 is bigger than 0.5, so you should not rent. All right? So 0.5 is less than 0.7, so don't rent the machine. Right? How many of you said no? Is this kind of the, was this, this kind of the back of the envelope calculation you were doing? Is that right? right? It's kind of back of the envelope calculation that accountants do. Right? So what's going on here? Now, our business school student up in the balcony says you should rent. He took accounting. I know he did that because he has to take accounting at business school. So what's wrong? Did, did, did he fail accounting or is this answer wrong? The answer is wrong. Right, there's two things you need to know about accountants. One is that they're usually boring, uh, and the other is that they're often wrong. Right? They're more often boring than wrong, but they're, well, they're almost always boring. But, all right? So this, is, this answer is kind of boring, right? and it happens also to be wrong. Why is it wrong? It's wrong because we made an assumption here that's not a good assumption. We made the assumption that you're going to go on producing the same amount per year after you've invested in the new machine that lowers marginal costs as you are producing beforehand. All right? All right? We made the assumption that it would lower your, we know it lowers your costs, and we assumed implicitly you'd go on producing a million tons a year. But that's not right. So let's try and have a more sophisticated answer. And if you want to be more sophisticated and less boring than accounting, what class would you want to take? Economics, probably, right? All right, so let's have a look at an, e at an economics answer. Let's look at an economics 115 answer. How many of you have taken economics 115? How many of you are in one, uh, 115 at the moment? Quite a few, OK. So let's have a look at, uh, at the economics answer. Let's see why that previous answer was wrong. So here is QA, and here is cost of a dollar. Your new cost will be 50 cents. All right, so I'm putting prices and cost on this axis. All right, and here is your residual demand curve. This is the demand curve you face after the other guy has finished producing. So this is your residual demand curve. It's the demand curve on that part of the market you're supplying, or not being supplied by the other side of the market. And to figure out your optimal quantity on your residual demand curve, what you should do, it's like you're, you're a monopolist on this residual demand curve, so you should set what? Yeah, say it again, shout out. Yeah, if the answer isn't backward induction, it's probably marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right? So let's try that. So uh, here's the marginal revenue curve. Right, roughly speaking, it should be twice as steep. This is residual marginal revenue. All right, and here's what you used to produce. Right, so we know what this is. This was a million tons. Right, this was marginal revenue hitting marginal cost. Now your costs have gone down. So notice that your quantity, your new quantity, has gone up. The new quantity has gone up because you've slid down the marginal revenue curve as the marginal cost curve dropped. Is that clear to everybody? All right. So this is the kind of picture that you probably saw a lot of in 115. Is that right? Or in 150, for that matter. Is that correct? So notice in this picture, we can actually see the accountant's answer, the boring answer. The boring answer is this rectangle. Right? This rectangle. This is the accounting answer. This rectangle is 0.5 times 1. So it comes out as a half. And that's, that's the, that was the accountant's answer. And what did they miss? What did the accountants miss? 
They missed the triangle, right? They missed the triangle. They missed this triangle. So I, I told you they were boring. They're a little bit square. So they tend to miss triangles. All right? So here's the triangle that they missed. All right? So we missed this triangle. All right? And how big is this triangle? Well, we could do it at home. It's half base times height. All right? So we could figure this out. We know the slope of this line. We know the slope of this line is a third. We know the slope of this line is two thirds. We know that the height of this triangle is a half. Uh, we, know, uh, we, we, uh, we, we could figure out what the width is as well, therefore. We could do half base times height. Turns out that this has area. Uh, I, I did this at home, so let me just uh, write it down. Uh, it has area 3 sixteenths. All right? So again, ev everyone could figure out the area of a triangle at home. Is that right? You, you, all, you all know that from your probably junior high school geometry. So assume I did it correctly at home. This is 3 sixteenths, which is approximately 0.19. Right? So we missed this 0.19. We missed this 0.19. All right, so how are we doing now? So we know from the accounting answer we had a half in savings. We know from the economics answer that we should add another 0.19 to this, that's the triangle, for a total of 0.69. But unfortunately, this is still less than 0.7, which is the cost of the machine, the per annum cost of the machine. So it looks like we should still not rent. So even after taking Economics 115, which is a good thing to do and is much less boring than accounting, and we'll get you the accounting answer anyway if you do things carefully, we still end up concluding you shouldn't rent. But our guy from the business school said you should rent, right? So did he fail economics as well as accounting? Or is this answer wrong? This answer's still wrong. This answer's still wrong. Oh, where's the tongue? Okay. All right. There we go. I think that board is broken. All right, this answer's still wrong. Didn't really want to delete that. That's a shame. Uh, well, I don't now. <laughs> all right. You've all got those numbers somewhere. I hope they're in my notes. This answer is still wrong. We need to get the right answer. All right? So what we need is a third answer, which is the game theory answer. which is also known as the right answer. All right. What are we missing? What's wrong with the economics answer? Somebody. What's wrong? Everyone knew it was wrong. Why is it wrong? It looked pretty good. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Let's, have, let's bounce down here. Somebody in the front row will help me. Why is this? What did I do wrong? also changes its quantity. Right. We assumed, not only, in the accounting answer, we assumed that firm A kept its quantity fixed, that we kept our quantity fixed, and that was wrong. But in addition, firm B is going to change its quantity, isn't it? Firm B is going to change its quantity. But let's, have a, let's remind ourselves why. We're still playing Corno competition. Here's our Corno diagram with QA and QB. So prior to making this investment, the model is symmetric. Here it is. And this is the old best response of firm A. And this is the best response of firm B. All right. And what we've learned, what we learned just now in the economics answer is what? We learned that firm A, as its costs go down, will produce more for each possible quantity that firm B produces. So regardless of what generated this residual demand curve, as the costs go down for firm A, it increases its quantity. Right? So we know that. We know that. So what's that telling us? It's telling us that the new best response of firm A is shifted to the right. 
This is the new best response of firm A. It shifts to the right. It now produces more for any given quantity that firm B produces. All right? So QA has gone up. That was our economics answer. All right? But that leads firm B to do what? To produce less. That leads to QB producing less. Notice we slid down firm B's best response line from the old equilibrium to the new equilibrium. And at the new equilibrium, firm B's production has gone down. How, by the way, what kind of game, what kind of game is it where as firm A increases its strategy, firm B decreases its strategy in response? Strategic substitutes, right? So because this is a game of strategic substitutes, the strategic substitutes. Good interview word, right? Good word to mention in an interview. Because this is a game of strategic substitutes, we know that firm B reduces its quantity. As firm B reduces its quantity, is that good for A or bad for A? It's good for A, right? This is good for A. This is good for firm a, it softens competition, right? It softens competition, right? And as a consequence, it leads to an increase in profit. It, again, we, could, we don't have time today, but what we could do is we could go back and we could recalculate the new uh, Corno equilibrium, right? We could calculate this. We could, as a homework exercise, try it, calculate the new Nash equilibrium, and notice this is a Nash equilibrium in a subgame. All right? Why is this a subgame? Because firm A made its decision whether to buy this new machine or not, and then they played Corneau. But so the Corneau game, the game up here, what is this? This is the subgame. Right? This is the diagram of the subgame, if you like. Right? It's the best response. It's the best responses in the subgame. So what subgame perfection tells us to do here is, first of all, work out the new equilibrium in the subgame, work out how much that new equilibrium is worth for firm A, and then roll it back to the investment decision. Right? It turns out, it turns out when we do that, we get an extra 0.31 million dollars. All right? So we can do it at home. We get an extra. 0.31 million dollars. So it turns out that our MBA student was right, good, all right? It turns out that if you add this 0.31 to the 0.69 we had already, we get one, which of course is much bigger than 0.7, and indeed, you should rent the machine. Now, I want you to have two takeaway lessons from this game. The first takeaway lesson is this. When you're analyzing a game like this, be it in the real world or in a job interview, the first thing you want to do is what? You want to look at the sub game. You want to look what would happen if you did invest and solve out the new Nash equilibrium in that sub game. Then you want to roll back the value of that subgame back into the initial decision, which is the strategic investment decision, whether to buy this, whether to rent this machine or not. All right. So schematically, the game looks like this: rent or not rent. And in either case, you play Corneau. Right. There's a subgame in each case. In this case, you play. Symmetric corno when you both have the same costs. And here you play asymmetric corno where you have different costs. And the way we analyze this game is we solve out the symmetric corno. We actually did that up front. We now solve out the new equilibrium in this asymmetric corno game. This one here, right? This is the old one, and this is the new one. Solve it out. Work out how much profit you're going to get and roll that back, remembering that it costs you 0.7 million to make this step. 
So that's the first takeaway lesson. But the second takeaway lesson is more general. So let me just pause and get everyone to wake up again so I make it. The second takeaway lesson is this. What tipped the balance here from the economics answer and the accounting answer were the strategic effects. It was the strategic effects. This was a strategic effect. It was the effect of the other firm or other players changing their behavior. And the most common mistake to make when you're thinking about strategic decisions is what? It's to forget that they're strategic. It's to forget that the other players are going to change their behavior. In this example, the other firm cuts back its production so much as to make that investment profitable. But let me give you two other examples. Example number one, you're designing a tax policy for the US. The dumb way to analyze this is to say, look at what people are doing now, push through the new tax numbers, and act like an accountant and crunch out how much money the government's going to make. Right? Why is that wrong? Because you're forgetting that as you change the tax code, people's behavior changes. Incentives change and people's behavior change. It leads to a mistake in designing the tax code. You need to take into account strategic effects, how behavior changes. Example number two, closer to home. You're designing a new curriculum for Yale. So you change the rules of the curriculum. And when analyzing it, you say, well, I wouldn't say this, but some people on, on a committee might say this, under these new rules, if we look at what people used to do, they will now do more of this and less of that, and they'll learn this and learn that. What are you missing? You're missing that students are players, and students change their behavior as you change the curriculum rules. All right? So the, the biggest lesson of today's class is don't be like an accountant, partly because it's boring and you won't, get, you won't go on your dates, and partly because you'll miss out on these important strategic effects. We'll come back and look at more on Wednesday.